Hey everyone, Ryan here and welcome back to our Operative Dentistry series. In this video, we'll cover everything from hand instruments to hand pieces and burrs used in operative dentistry. So put on your seatbelt and let's get to it. So the two main categories of dental hand instruments are non-cutting and cutting instruments. This is certainly not a list of every dental instrument out there, but the ones that are most commonly used and that'll come up on the board exam. In the second half of the video, we'll talk about hand pieces, which fall into their own category. So dental hand instruments have three main regions. The handle, which is represented here by the letter C, is usually about six millimeters in diameter. It can be eight sided like the one shown here, or it can be round. And sometimes it has a ribbed grip like you see here, or it can be smooth and flat. The shank is represented here by the letter B, and the shank may have one or more bends in it. You see one bend right here, and then another right here. And that allows the working end, which we'll talk about in a second, to be aligned with the long axis of the handle. And so the working end is represented by the letter A, and it should lie along the long axis of the instrument for the best balance and control. So you can see and appreciate how that lines up pretty well with the long axis of the rest of the instrument there. And the working end either consists of a blade and a cutting edge, or a nib and a face. So the blade and cutting edge refers to terms for a cutting instrument, nib and face for a non-cutting instrument. So if we look at these diagrams up here, the nib refers to the entire hook part of this dental explorer, which is a non-cutting instrument. The face refers to the little point or the explorer tine at the very end of the instrument. That's the part that's contacting the tooth or the restorative material. For cutting instruments, we have different terminology. The blade is the actual cutting part of the instrument, so that's this entire portion right here. And even more specifically, the cutting edge is the tiny little edge, the specific sharp part that contacts the tooth or the restorative material. So the handle is what you hold, the shank is for transition, and the working end is what actually does the work. So now we can talk about some specific non-cutting dental hand instruments. So first we'll talk about the dental mirror. This small angled mirror allows you to see areas of the mouth that otherwise would be difficult or impossible to see. For example, the occlusal surfaces of the upper molars or lingual surfaces of the upper incisors would require you to have the patient sitting way back and you'd likely have to twist your neck somehow to get a clear view, but the mirror makes this a lot easier. We call this ability to look at oral structures using the mirror in direct vision, as opposed to direct vision, where your eyes can look at the tooth or structure of interest directly. The Dental Explorer provides tactile sensitivity to detect if margins of restorations have good integrity with the surrounding tooth structure, the margins of crowns fit well to the tooth, and there are many other uses. Historically, they've been used to detect caries, but doing so too roughly can actually transition an incipient lesion to a cavitated lesion, like we talked about in the previous two videos. So we have different variations of the Explorer. The shepherd's hook may be the most commonly used, also, a number, also called a number 23 Explorer. This is the classic curved end, again, most commonly used today. The back action explorer, or the number 17, is this flatter, shorter hook, which is great for detecting uh, interproximal areas, if you're detecting margins of restorations between teeth, and also for detecting subgingival calculus. Lastly, there is the number two, or pigtail explorer, which curves under and around, and can be preferred by some providers for detecting crown and restoration margins. 
Again, there are more out there, but these are among the most common and commonly tested. The periodontal probe is used to routinely measure pocket depths, and they can be used to measure other things like the width of teeth, the amount of overbite of a patient, etc. There are different versions of this as well. The UNC 15 probe measures up to 15 millimeters. Each mark here, it's kind of small to see, but each mark represents one millimeter, and the bigger hash marks here represent four to five millimeters, nine to 10, and the final increment 14 to 15. The Williams probe has little marks at one, two, three. It skips four, goes to five, skips six, and then seven, eight, nine, 10. And the marquee probe shows three millimeter increments. Zero to three is this first silver part. Then three to six is this thick hash, six to nine, nine to 12, etc. The amalgam condenser is used to condense amalgam into the depths and corners of a cavity preparation to ensure that there are no voids in the material. It can be also used for condensing composite in much the same way. Remember, we're still talking about non-cutting instruments here. So this part, the working end of this instrument is going to be called the nib. And it's the portion of the condensing instrument that does the work. And the face is the actual end of the instrument that comes into contact with the restorative material being condensed. This part is usually smooth, but it can also be serrated. The ball burnisher is one of my personal favorite. It typically has two ends, a small round end, and a larger football shaped end. And it's really great for burnishing and even carving the surface of an amalgam restoration before it completely sets to give it some contour and anatomy or it can be used in a similar way to smooth out the occlusal surface of a composite restoration before it's cured. All right, so that's a brief overview of some of the most common non-cutting instruments. Let's talk about some cutting dental hand instruments this time. And we'll look at most of the, in fact, we'll look at all of the instruments listed here on this slide. It's a bit of an overgeneralization here, but this is generally what each of these categories of instruments applies to and works on. And I find it help as a helpful memory tool for the board exam, just to keep this in the back of your head. So scalers are typically working to remove calculus from teeth. Excavators are typically used on removing carious dentin, or at least working on dentin to structure. Chisels for removing unsupported and or friable enamel. And the other category, typically these are gonna be used for modifying the restoration of some sort. Others, basically a category I threw together of couple instruments that we'll mention at the end of this section of the video. All right, we can now introduce a formula that describes the dimensions of the working end of most cutting instruments. I see this come up on the board exams quite frequently, so let's spend some time unpacking and really understanding this concept. So the formula consists of four numbers. The first number corresponds to the width of the blade in tenths of a millimeter. So a number 10, a number of 10 means that the blade is one millimeter wide. So if we're looking at the width of the blade, we're talking about this dimension right in here. So again, a number of 10 for this number refers to one millimeter width of the blade, which is quite common and also is the case for the instrument pictured here. So we'll write 10 down here for the first number. The second number refers to the angle of the cutting edge to the long axis of the blade. So this one is a little bit more involved. The cutting edge is here, the actual part that's contacting the tooth or restorative material, and the long axis of the blade runs up here. I apologize for not a perfect straight line there, but you can see what I'm going for there. So the angle between these two lines is a perfect 90 degrees in this case. So for this, we would just write 90 for our second number. 
and that's the angle between the blade and the cutting edge. But if and only if this is 90 degrees, we can actually omit the second number from the formula. And that's because 90 is the most common. Most of these instruments are going to have a blade that is perpendicular to its cutting edge. So we, don't, we can omit that number and we just assume that that angle is 90 degrees. Otherwise, we have to list what that angle is. All right, let's move to the third number. This simply corresponds to the length of the blade. So that's going to be this dimension right in here. And so it's simp simply listing the length of the blade in millimeters. So this one's nice and easy. The blade happens to be seven millimeters long. So the third number, we just write seven. And finally, the fourth number, we get a little bit more complicated again. And the fourth number corresponds to the angle of the blade relative to the long axis of the handle. So remember the second number was the angle of the cutting edge to the long axis of the blade. Now this is the angle of the blade to the long axis of the handle or the entire instrument. So because there's a lot more variation in this number, it can literally be anywhere between zero and 360 degrees. So this one is reported not as an angle, but as a percentage of 360 degrees. So if this number were 10, let's say, that would signify 10% of 360 degrees, which means the blade would be 36 degrees off axis. This instrument's four, fourth number happens to be 14, which would correspond to 14% of 360 degrees, which is about 50 degrees. So the angle that this blade takes relative to the long axis of the handle, which runs this way, this angle right in here happens to be 50 degrees. So we don't write 50, we write 14, which represents 14% 14 of 360 degrees. So if you can remember what each of these numbers just kind of generally represents, that will be enormously helpful on the board exam. And the idea behind all of this is that if you know the formula of a cutting instrument, you can visualize and identify what kind of hand instrument it's describing. And the board exam will sometimes even refer to the specific formulas. So I'll include them in the slides for each of the following instruments we discuss. But if you got nothing else out of this slide, just remember the kind of this part of the descriptions, and that will be enough to net you at least one or two questions when they ask about what a specific number of the formula refers to. And here's just another way of looking at it, and we just broke this down a bit more simply. So let's start with the dental scalers, and we'll actually start with an exception. The scalers that are used to remove calculus are one of the few cutting instruments that don't have that four digit formula. In fact, they follow a different numbering system entirely that we discuss more in depth in the periodontics series if you're interested in that. So scalers usually are two-sided and each working end has two cutting edges to it and they adapt closely to the two surface and remove calculus from the crown or the root surface. There are universal types that can be used anywhere in the mouth, and then specific types like Gracie instruments that are designed for specific teeth and areas in the mouth. Down here, we have another categorization. Sickle scalers are scalers that have sharp points at the end of their blades and they are used for calculus above the gum line or super gingival calculus so that you don't accidentally shred the gum tissue if you drive that sharp point subgingivally. Curettes on the other hand, not pictured here, have rounded edges and are used for calculus below the gum line because you have less risk of damaging the soft tissue. Spoon excavators are used for gentle and controlled caries removal. 
their formula is 11.5714. And now you know what all of that is talking about. The second number is omitted because the cutting edge is perpendicular to the blade, as it is in most instruments. Some operators like using small controlled movements with the spoon excavator to scrape carious dentin with the spoon-shaped paddles of this excavator, and this is most useful for very soft, infected dentin removal. The black spoon is just a larger, more robust version of the spoon excavator. It can be also used to burnish metal, like a Toffelmeyer matrix band, or the margin of a gold crown with the rounded back of this black spoon working end. And you can notice how this first number is larger, 15 referring to the blade width being 1.5 millimeters as opposed to a little bit less in the spoon excavator. The enamel hatchet is a double-ended cutting instrument used for planing walls of enamel. And the bevel on one end of the instrument planes the facial wall, and the bevel on the other end of the instrument planes the lingual wall. Here's a close-up view of what that process might look like in part of the cavity preparation process. The bin angle chisel is also a double-ended cutting instrument used for planing walls of enamel. It's called bin angle because there are two angles in the shank. We can locate one here and one here, and that's to allow for the proper orientation of the blade for optimal control and balance when using this instrument. It's similar to the enamel hatchet in function, but this blade happens to be perpendicular to the blade of the enamel hatchet. So it, it enables use in the other side of the mouth or in areas that an enamel hatchet simply cannot access. So if we compare this directly with the enamel hatchet, you can see how this blade, you can kind of see the face of that blade, whereas this one is parallel to the screen or perpendicular to the screen, I should say, so that you can notice that those two blades are perpendicular to each other. The gingival margin trimmer is similar to the enamel hatchet, except this instrument is designed for planing enamel at the gingival floor of a preparation rather than the facial and lingual walls like the two instruments we just talked about. And don't worry, we'll talk much more about the anatomy of a cavity preparation, including the external and internal walls in the next video in this series. So the cutting edge of this instrument is most importantly not perpendicular to the long axis of the blade. So this is one of the times when there will be a second number in this four-digit formula for the distinct two versions of this gingival marginal trimmer. So the distal margin trimmer is has a number, a second number that's greater than 90, which is for a gingival floor on the distal side of a tooth. The mesial gingival margin trimmer has a number less than 90, which is for the gingival floor on the mesial side of a tooth. So just remember for the distal, you're gonna see a number greater than 90. For the mesial version of this instrument, you're gonna see a second number less than 90. The main difference and benefit of the gingival margin trimmer over the enamel hatchet is that angle of the cutting edge, which allows for, for you to properly bevel the gingival floor. And again, we can talk about more of that in the rest of the series. So you can appreciate how this enamel hatchet, again, that cutting edge is perpendicular to the long axis of the blade, whereas that is not the case we were to follow that long axis of the blade, this cutting edge is not perpendicular and nor is this one. And this is showing the two different variations of this instrument, depending on which side of the tooth you're working on. All right, next we have the discoid cleoid carver, which is yet another double-ended instrument. 
It typically has a rounded handle and it's used for a carving and contouring amalgam. The cleoid end refers to the claw-like end for carving grooves into the amalgam. And the discoid end is this circular disc-like end for carving pits and fossa in the amalgam. The Holland back carver is a double-ended round handle instrument used for placing, carving, and contouring amalgam. The two ends on either side of the instrument are oriented 90 degrees to one another. All right, so that's enough about hand instruments. Let's talk about how to hold them. So a normal pen grasp involves holding a dental instrument with your index finger and your thumb, and the instrument would rest on the middle finger supporting it. Your ring finger is used as a finger rest on a nearby steady surface to keep this hand stabilized. However, the board examiners and most dental providers today prefer the modified pen grasp, which adds the middle finger to grabbing the instrument. And so the instrument would then rest on the ring finger behind it. This provides additional control for fine motor function. And then you use both your ring finger and your pinky finger together for a stable finger rest. A firm finger rest is necessary for stabilization of your hand. So in the case the patient moves it around, you essentially move with them because those fingers are directly and stably supported on one of their oral structures. So you can rest on adjacent teeth or the maxilla, which are the most stable structures. The mandible is stable if the patient is biting on a bite block, but otherwise they can freely open or close. And again, you will move with them if that's the case. Also maintaining a short working radius is important. And that means that you grab the instrument more towards the working end so that your fulcrum is nearer to the working end for more control and more accuracy. All right, let's talk about rotary instruments now. So we have the low speed or slow speed handpiece, which operates at less than 12,000 RPMs. RPMs are revolutions per minute. And even though it's the slowest of these handpiece varieties, 12,000 RPM is still pretty quick. That's 200 spins per second. And so it can easily injure yourself or the patient if you're not careful. The low speed handpiece is used for cleaning and polishing teeth with a profi cup, for finishing and polishing a restoration with a polishing cup or brush, and perhaps most important for the board exam for caries excavation. The board examiners love to ask about this that a large round burr in a slow speed handpiece is the best way to carefully remove affected dentin near the pulp. Here is the slow speed motor. This is the latch type contra angle slow speed attachment for caries excavation and polishing. And this here is the straight attachment for the profi cup for hygiene cleanings. The high speed handpiece is used for tooth preparation, whether that be for caries removal, for crowns, removing old restorations, and many other procedures that require quote unquote drilling teeth. They usually have a fiber optic light and an air water spray built into the unit. The medium speed handpiece is not routinely used, but it can be used for the same applications as the high speed, though not quite as efficient. And notice how the high speed operates at greater than 200,000 RPM. So you can imagine how quick that burr that's going to be inside that handpiece is going to be rotating. The medium speed operates between these two thresholds for low and high speed. The rheostat is this foot pedal that's used to control all of these handpiece varieties, often with variable speed 
depending on how hard you push down on this foot pedal. The switch right here turns the water on and off when you're using a high-speed handpiece. So burrs that you load into the handpieces have their own anatomy, of course, more terminology, but there's an overlapping term with hand instruments that can be kind of confusing. So let's break this down real quick. A burr consists of a shank, which does not serve the same purpose as the shank for hand instruments. So the shank here is the part of the burr that is inserted into the head of the handpiece. So that's the part that's going inside this area of the handpiece. The neck is the part which transitions to the head, which is the actual cutting part of the instrument that does the work. The first of these is a high speed burr. The second of these is a latch type slow speed burr. So burrs were um, created and we had two main categories of these, diamond burrs, historically called diamond instruments and not burrs, but we're going to call them and collapse them into the greater category of burrs because that's what the ADA and manufacturers have done. So let's talk about the carbide burrs first. They're made of tungsten carbide, and this is what they look like. They come in a variety of sizes and shapes, and because of their material and design, they are better for end cutting. So they're better for cutting at their ends, like for punch cuts to start a preparation. They also create a smooth preparation wall. They're good for amalgam removal and for creating retentive features. They also tend to produce less heat. The diamond burrs, on the other hand, are, are better for side cutting, although you can use either of these for end and side cutting, of course. But if we're being technical and talking about things that the board examiners like to ask, they are better for side cutting and are therefore preferable for preparations, bevels, and enameloplasty due to the greater hardness of diamond and the more effective cutting overall. But as a downside, it generates more heat and they are way more expensive. Interestingly, for carbide burrs, the amount of blades corresponds to its function. So if we start with six blades, that is a typical cutting burr. But if we go up to 12 blades, that is a finishing burr. So it's going to cut less, but it's going to cut smoother. So it's great for finishing a restoration, getting towards that polishing final state. If we add even more blades to the mix, we're getting into fine and ultra fine finishing burrs. So you can think of it like this, the more blades that you have, the less two structure each of those blades is going to be digging in. So more blades means a smoother cut and less blades is more aggressive and more cutting efficient. For diamonds, similar policy, but the finer the grit of the diamond, the less aggressive the burr will be, the coarser the grit of the diamond, the more aggressive it will be. So let's talk about some specific burrs commonly tested on the board exam. And I mean, these come up all the time. The 245 burr pictured here on the left is three millimeters long and 0.8 millimeters in diameter. I wish I had some kind of memory trick for you, but I promise you memorize this if you can, it will certainly show up on test day. So three millimeters long, this part here, 0.8 millimeters in diameter. It's described as being pear-shaped or inverted cone, sometimes it's called an inverted cone design, and it has these rounded corners along the bottom and it sort of tapers up towards the, sh towards the neck of the instrument. The 330 burr pictured on the right is half the length of the 245, so it's only 1.5 millimeters long, but it's the same diameter. It's sort of an optical illusion here, but this is actually the same diameter. It's still 0.8 millimeters in diameter, and it's the same shape, pear-shaped or inverted cone. 
The smaller size is helpful for pediatric preparations. So it's an, often a go-to for your primary tooth cavity preps. And lastly, we have the 169 Elber, another commonly chosen one. This is a tapered fissured design. It tapers down this way as you go towards the neck of the instrument. And it's preferred for this thin, thin tip of the burr that's used for creating retentive features and secondary retentive features. And we can talk more about slot design in the next video. So 245, 330, most commonly tested 169L sometimes gets tested for its unique shape. And lastly, some hazards that we need to talk about for uh, these rotary instruments. I mentioned even the slow speeds are operating at relatively quick speeds, and so you can easily damage tissue if you're not careful. So some things to keep in mind, the pulp is at risk due to the vibration caused by the instrument, heat generated, particularly from diamond instruments, and desiccation. So it's always important if you're operating at high speeds, you're generating a lot of heat, we wanna rely on that air and water spray from the handpiece and also making sure that everything is well isolated so that we don't slip and damage soft tissue. The lips, the tongue, and the cheek are all examples of nearby soft tissue. So using cotton roll isolation, rubber dam isolation, using firm finger rests, uh, operating with your fulcrum near to the working end, of a hand instrument, all of those are great practices to eliminate potential hazards. Also, we have to protect our eyes. We use glasses with side shields, protect our ears. You know, we have potential hearing loss, which depends on the intensity of the loudness, the frequency of the sound, the duration of the noise, and the susceptibility of the individual. These hand pieces can get quite loud, and if you're using them all through the day, Monday to Friday, you're going to be um, experiencing quite a lot of uh, duration of noise. So that's something to keep in mind as well. And of course, inhalation risk. You know, these things, uh, I'm sure we're going to get uh, some changes in our PPE after this uh, coronavirus pandemic. But as far as the board exam is concerned for now, things they like to know for you to know about is that the rubber dam protects the patient from inhalation, and masks protect the personnel, including the doctor and the staff. All right, so that's it for this video on instrumentation. I know it was a lot of stuff to cover, but hopefully you found it helpful and enjoyed listening. So thank you so much for watching, guys. Please like this video if you enjoyed it, and subscribe to this channel for much more on operative and all things dentistry. If you're interested in supporting this channel and what I do, please check out my Patreon page. Thank you to Michael Raja, Reb Boyd, Rhea Wadwa, Jonathan Muff, David Jaden, Isabella Caldas, Ali Benjdir, Badir Hefnawi, and all of my patrons out there for their support. You can unlock extra content like access to my video slides if you want to take notes on them, and additional practice questions and explanations for the board exam. So go check that out. The link is in the description below. Thanks again for watching, everyone. I'll see you in the next video.